Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit. I have Mr. Jim Welsh of Macro Tides. Happy Friday to you, sir. Good to see you. Hey, after a four-day week, when you get a five-day week, it always just feels so much longer. It was last Monday, the holiday, and this just feels like a five-day work week, even though it was only four days. Right. It does kind of feel that way. I know, you know, we got some pretty big moves in the market. Maybe that's yeah. what um that's what 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 makes this a little bit um more of an extended short week than than normal. Uh, so tell me how you're, you're feeling this week. I mean, we finally broke 4,000 in the S and P. I know you, you're going to bring yeah. out your technicals, yeah, 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 but yeah. how are you feeling about overall about the, the market at this juncture? Cause we've dipped to some pretty key levels. I think, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get really short down here or real bearish, <laughs> but the flip side is, do you, do you turn around and get bullish? I mean, you know, how, how are you yeah. feeling? Uh, well, again, uh, I thought we were going to get a bounce last week when we spoke on Friday. There were some intermarket divergences between the S&P, the Russell 2000. The S&P had gotten below its February 10th low. The Russell didn't. The value line didn't. The transports didn't. All that was a setup for, OK, we could get a bounce. Uh, Treasury yields behaved in a way that suggested, OK, we may get a little dip. All of that was negated early on Tuesday morning when we saw uh, the Russell, the trans, all the things that didn't break the February 10th low on Friday the 17th, did on the 21st. So that eliminated that. Um, in the February macro tides, you know, the subtitle was inflation is not dead yet. And I went through why I thought we were going to see things like the CPI tick higher and that that would be unsettling for the, the, for the markets. Um, and we've seen a real repricing in the Fed funds futures you know, for months, you and I were talking and it's like Fed funds futures were below the Fed's peak and then looking for rate cuts. In the last two weeks or so after the employment report, CPI, these other inflation reports, the Fed futures have really adjusted in terms of where they're pricing the Fed. They're more in line, if you will, with the Fed's dot plot. I think the key thing that's still missing, though, Blake, is people are still thinking that the economy is on OK footing and a recession is going to be avoided, I think, and as I've been saying this for a while, that's the next shoe to drop. As we get into the second quarter, we're going to see more data points showing the economy really is slowing. And it's like the perfect whiplash. Last summer, everybody was looking for a recession. And now it's like no landing. It's not going to be a hard, soft, no, we're not going to have any kind of landing. Right. And it's the perfect setup for the market to be like, oh, boy, we were wrong, you know, another Wiley e. Coyote moment. And I think that's what's coming in the movement we've seen with Fed funds futures and kind of the breakdown in the S&P suggests, yes, I think we've got a bounce coming. I don't think, I think there's a good chance we're not going to see the S&P above 4,195, which was the high a few weeks ago. All right, this gets to the point, um, you know, two, three weeks ago, Fed funds futures were saying, no, we're, the Fed's only going to 487. And by the end of the year, they're going to be down to 437. Now what you see is Fed funds futures are up to about 530. In other words, A, the Fed's going to increase three more times. And uh, they're headed above the 51 mark, which is what the Fed indicated in December uh, for the rest of this year. Jim, can I can I stop and ask you real quick? Do do you, yeah. when you're when you're talking about that they could raise maybe another seventy five basis points? What do you do? You think they're gonna? I I'll use your term from last year. Front load it? Do you, could they do a fifty and a quarter? I mean, what are your thoughts? I don't think so. Now you know, Mester last week, Bullard last week. I think Kashgari is another guy. Because the minutes came out on Wednesday and they said, yeah, there were some people that were in favor of a 50 basis point hike last month. I just think the odds are the and, and Mester and Bullard are not voters at this point in time. So to me, that's always important to note who's a voter, who who gets to, you know, kind of throw the the weight in terms of actually coming through and uh, with uh, an increase like that. I think the overwhelming sentiment is going to be. We want to avoid this, the mistakes of the 1970s by going too fast, too far, causing a recession. I think that argument will uh, outweigh the idea of, hey, we we're going to get to five and three eighths anyway. Let's just get there quick. I think the predominance are going to be, let's go a quarter in, in uh, March, probably go another quarter in May, and then we'll, that will buy another three to four months of data to decide what we're going to do in June. So that's my bias. I think the Fed goes 25 basis points in March. 
And that's why I think there's, you know, the potential. Um, you know, let's back up a second. The, the January employment report was huge. Well, guess what? The February employment report is going to probably be less than half of January, and it might even be sub 200,000. Well, the yeah. retail sales number was huge. That is not, you know, I think weather influenced that number, gift card receipts, because, you know, people take out gift cards in November, December. That doesn't count for retail sales. It counts when people spend it. And I think the combination of warmer weather in January, people going out and using some of the money they got for the holidays on gift cards, goosed uh, retail sales. So my point being is, I think we got a little bit of head fake in terms of the degree of strength in the economy uh, in January. I think that gets taken back. And that means when we get to the next Fed meeting, I think the markets are, will already be like, hey, they're only going to go 25, not 50. And I think that'll be the backdrop of why we can see another rally coming in the S&P. Um, but I, I, again, as you know, my take has been, I think we're going to 3,500 and potentially 3,200 at some point in time this year. So right now I'm just trying to figure out, okay, where's the best place to go short? And I, I'm still of the mind that there's another push up coming in, in the market. Um, in effect, the Fed funds futures have gone from doubting the Fed completely to now they're kind of almost front running the Fed. And I, I just think that, you know, the, the idea that the Fed's going to go 50 basis points is going to be proven wrong. And when that becomes more obvious, the markets are going to respond. We'll see the Fed fund futures come down a little bit. Um, and that ought to help Treasury yields a little bit, too. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk we'll about see. your chart here on yeah. LEI. So what are you saying yeah. with this? Well, well, this is what, you know, I've shown this, you know, a few times over the last two, three months, because... I think this is the best recession indicator there is. There's 10 separate economic data points in this, including the uh, uh, yield curve. Um, and what we've seen is down 10 months in a row. The drop that has happened since 1960 has always been associated with a recession. So this is why I'm saying it's like the perfect whipsaw setup. People went from, oh, my God, we're in a recession last summer to, hey, the, we don't have to worry about fine. one now. Yeah. Just in time for this to hit the fan. And again, you know, these just like the yield curve, the average yield, uh, the lead time is like 19 months. So, you know, in a world where people are trading 24 options, 24 hour options, the idea of 19 months is like a different universe. Right. So, I, that, it's like and, and at some point you go, well, shoot, it's never going to come, you know, as exactly right. And if it hasn't come by now with the, all the Fed tightening that has been done, it's not going to happen. And I think that's kind of where the market talked itself into. And the head fake, of the strength of some of the, the recent data just reinforced that. And I just think, hey, as we get six months down the road, more and more of the excess savings that were built up during the pandemic are going to get spent. More and more people will get to that point where it's like, OK, we're going to cut back a little bit. Um, and, and again, I just think it always takes longer than you expect. But this is the other shoe that's going to drop, in my opinion, in coming months, whether or not it's a recession uh, you know, to me, a secondary relative to the narrative that's taken hold. In other words, we're going to see a pronounced slowdown in the economy. There's going to be at least one quarter, I believe, where GDP will be negative, even if we avoid a recession. And the problem is once things start to retrench, they can kind of take a life of their own. And that's why I think at some point in time, if the economy slows, as I expect, there'll be enough slowing that people say, whoa, wait a second, maybe it won't be a soft landing. And the key thing here, the Fed has signaled it would rather be too late than too early. You know, uh, easing too soon is a bigger mistake than letting a recession unfold. So I keep it, you know, I've said this numerous times. There's a window of time where the economy is weakening and the Fed is not reacting to that. And the market is going to be dealing with, geez, the economy is weaker than we thought. Earnings estimates got to get cut. And that window of time could last one or two months, but that's where you could see 10 to 15% get peeled off pretty quickly. And if that unfolds that way, that's going to be, I think, a really good buying opportunity. And it, and it kind of feels that that's where we're kind of headed, especially after this week. But we, we'll talk about the technicals here yeah. in a minute. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's talk about the move index. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about volatility and bonds picking up. You got yields that are yeah. rallying. What, how, how do you feel about the move index? Well, and what's I'd it telling you? Yeah, I referenced this last week, and I forgot to include it last week. So I said, oh, I'll remember this week. So to me, just looking at the red lines show 
when uh, volatility is picking up, and, and I showed it against the S&P as opposed to Treasury yields, because the, the, the correlation with Treasury yields is obvious, right? Uh, if the move index is picking up, just like the VIX and the S&P, the VIX is going up, the S&P is probably going down. And what you can see, the correlation, when this, the VIX, the move index has broken out of a downtrend and starting to rise, you can see how it's correlated to declines in the S&P. And conversely, when it's you know rolled over and started to come down, how the markets rallied. About a week ago, this broke out. That's why I meant to do it last week, and I just didn't. I forgot. And to me, this is a yellow flashing sign in terms of the Treasury market because it implies that, hey, we're at really important levels with the 10 and 30-year Treasury bond. And this says, don't jump to any, in my opinion, don't jump to any big conclusions until we see volatility, this move index, start to become more constructive. It also implies that if it continues to trend higher, uh, you know, that's problematic for the S&P. One of the things I would watch is the two-year yield. We're right back to where it was in late December at the, the, the 475, 480 level. That's where we are. So we're at the cusp of the two-year breaking out. And if that happens, then I think Treasury yields will continue to get pulled up. So the next week or so is going to be really, really critical in terms of how the markets navigate you know the pivot points that they're at yeah that 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 is going to be really really interesting well um the next chart you brought up is of the inflation not yep. being dead well you know you're, you're telling us this now <laughs> but we well, got no. we just got the pce we got the PPI, yeah, 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 yeah. cpi well, I mean, that's the beauty look at the top line february yeah. macro ties was published on february 1st i might add the title was inflation may not be dead yet and i went through why the January inflation reports were likely to tick higher than people expected. Um, and what I'm showing here is, yeah, look what happened. The, the CPI was up 0.5 uh, versus a 0.1 in December. The PPI jumped even more because it was down in December. Um, but the, the the bigger takeaway, maybe, is, and in the March macro ties that I've begun writing, we're still going to see a significant drop in the next five months in uh, the CPI and other inflation metrics because of the takeaway values from last year are so huge. In the next five months, the CPI takeaway values from last year are 4.6%. So if the CPI in the next five months averages 0.3, that means that the, uh, the headline CPI is going to go from 6.4 down to about 3.2. So again, this is the head fake because I believe Powell... <laughs> telegraphed very clearly in his Brookings speech on November 30th, the pivot was going from inflation being the key metric to the labor market. And they believe that service inflation is what is most sticky and it's most correlated to labor market tightness. Wall Street still hasn't figured that out yet. So that's another shooter drop, I think, in coming months. But so my point is, I thought there was going to be a hiccup in the monthly numbers. Markets were going to react to that. Um, and I think they're going to be, you know, if I'm right, and CPI and other inflation metrics continue to drop over the next five months, as long as they're so focused on inflation and not the labor market, they're going to be vulnerable to, well, I guess we got that one wrong, too. Yeah. Well, you know, Jim, you you talked about technicals and you were like, uh, you know, if, if the stock market does a 10 or 15 percent sell off for current levels, you're going to find it as a buying opportunity. But why would you be buying if, if we're headed into this recession that you think is coming? Okay. Um, um, well, I'll answer that question, then we can look at the chart. That, um, yeah. It's a loaded yeah, question. Well, because but... historically, that's what happens. Okay. Historically, what happens is there's the recognition point where the stock market investors realize, oh, boy, we are going into a recession. Oh, we got to mark down earnings. The P.E. ratio shrinks from 18 to 15 to 4, whatever it is. It all happens in a really brief you know, moment of awareness of, oh, my God, my pants are at my ankles. And you get that flush. And, you know, what then comes, obviously, is the Fed easing. Now, I think it could be delayed a little bit more this time than in prior cycles. But once you get that flush, that's when you start looking at technical analysis looking for divergences, how oversold the market has become, to look for entry points. Um, so it's a process, but I think the overriding point here is 
the market doesn't wait until the economy shows signs of recovering after a recession. It's going to respond to the anticipation that monetary policy is going to start easing. And that's when the yield curve switches from being inverted to going back to a normal yield curve because short-term rates really start to come down. And so the decline in the two-year over, you know, from October to a few weeks ago was really another head fake. So anyway, that to me is the bigger picture. Last Friday when we spoke, I said, hey, you got this intermarket divergence. Because I, you know, in the last month or so, it was intermarket divergences and the treasury yields was suggested that yields were going to head up. That proved true. Intermarket divergence between gold and silver indicated gold was going to drop. That proved true. And there was an intermarket divergence last Friday between the S&P and the Russell 2000. The S&P had dropped below the February 10th low. Uh, and I should have that number on there, but I don't. Sorry. I think it was 4160 something. Um, but the Russell held above it. You know, the February 10th low on the Russell was 1904. Last Friday's low was 1928. So it's like, and the same thing happened. The value line composite was higher. The transports were higher. So that's the type of thing that happens. But on Tuesday morning, in the first hour and a half of trading, the Russell took out the February 10th low. The transports took the uh, February 10th low out on the opening. So all of a sudden, that setup is gone. So to me, this is where technical analysis can be pretty helpful because I was wrong in my assessment that, hey, these things are suggesting a high, but that framework provided uh, the uh, you know the information I needed to know you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. We're not about to have a rally. Okay. Well, so it, the next chart you brought up, Jim, is is the dollar, and and uh, you're looking at yields too, but you know, the dollar is really taken off here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it the tail wagging the dog or opposite? No, I think it's, again, you know, I said this a few weeks ago that the weakness in the dollar was built on the idea that the Fed would be cutting rates in the second half of this year on February 1st, when Powell was talking after the meeting, everybody took it as a dovish, dovish comment. And that's when I recommended going along the dollar. It was just above 101 uh, and buying the ETF UUP. Uh, because I thought they were misreading it and that we were going to see a tick up in inflation and people would start to realize, wait a second, the Fed's not cutting rates. They've been telling us that for two, three months. And so to me, the rally in the dollar is in response to the incorrect assessment of monetary policy. And the PCE today culminates, you know, as you noted, the CPI, the PPI came in hotter than expected. The PCE did too, even though expectations were even higher for the PCE yeah, they were after elevated. the other two came in higher. So to me, this pop is like, okay, sell into it. So just, you know, if you don't take everything off of the trade, I mean, it's up four and a half percent in less than a month. Right. So can it carry higher? Yes. Can it get up towards 106? Yes. You know, that's to me, one of the targets. I just think that potentially it may, you know, you may get a, a spike here either today and Monday, and then you go through that choppiness before you get that last leg up. You right. know, in a way, it's attempting to to identify the top of wave three in a wave five in a five wave rally. Sure. You know, okay. you know, going through the wave four decline is a pain, and then you get maybe marginal higher highs. So again, I think the employment report is going to come in maybe softer than expected. It's certainly relative to January, the inflation numbers are going to come in better when we get to mid so i just think hey this is a time to sell into strength take it okay i well, still think the dollar is going to go higher out a period of time but you know it's kind of like th that was a nice trade all right well you you're you talking know. about these intermarket divergences with yields and so how do you make this now because it was a great call um you know you got yields that bounce quite aggressively yeah but what yeah. now well, here's the interesting thing. You can see the 10-year got up to 397.8 uh, in the last day or so, relative to the descent, late December high of 390. But the 30-year uh, has not taken out. I mean, it got really close, less than a basis point. Yeah. So to me, this is like, okay, like last Friday, it's like, well, uh, based on what we know right this second, you got an intermarket divergence because the 30-year hasn't confirmed it. I don't have a high degree of conviction at this point, Blake, just because of looking, as I talked about earlier, the, the Treasury move index, uh, the uh, two year is pushing highs. Um, so, again, I think one has to give the benefit of the doubt that yields 
in the near term are likely to go higher. I don't have enough information in front of me to say, okay, time to step in front of this train. I just think that, you know, we're recognizing that markets were wrong about monetary policy. The implication then at some point in time is, in terms of equities, is that, gee whiz, the Fed has to go higher, that might cause a recession. But in terms of treasury yields, I don't think we're there yet. So in other words, I give the benefit of the doubt that yields could climb a little bit higher. Um, so I wouldn't stand in front of this. You know, I wouldn't take a long position. All right? I had a high degree of conviction when yields were three weeks ago on February 1st that they were going higher. I, I don't. I just like, OK, we got the move I expected. Now I'm going to just stand aside and wait to see, you know, what shows up next and and in terms of gold. Yeah, gold. I mean, gold sold off pretty aggressively. I, I would venture to guess that we're about if you look, at, you know, this once we completed wave five here, we're yeah. probably at least about, um, I don't know, 38 percent of this entire move here. I mean, what, what are you, how are you yeah. feeling about gold at this point? Yeah, well, I thought that gold would pull back to 1825. And I thought potentially the way things were setting up last week that we were going to get a bounce um, back towards the 1872, 1889. Uh, now gold is kind of convincingly taken out the 382 retracement uh, at 1825. Next stop is around 1785. So gold, as you see, the bottom panel shows the hour sides below 30, getting kind of oversold. So I think there's the potential, Blake, that if I'm right about the dollar hitting a short-term high, whether it's today or Monday or early next week, that gold might have a brief spike under 1800. But I think we have a decent shot at gold rebounding up to 1872, 1889. Um, and that's the way I would look at it. Uh, the bigger picture, um, I think there's the potential that whatever bounce gold gets, there may be another leg lower. Um, uh, I think the, the, what the Fed's going to do at the next meeting, in my opinion, is they're going to go 25 basis points. But the median projection for the funds rate was 5.1 in December. I think they're going to bump that up towards 5.3, 5 5.35, some number. And that's how you placate. The ones who want to go 50 basis points, you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going 25, but we're going to put the dots up from 5.1 to 5.3. So we're you know, communicating that, yes, we kind of think the funds rate needs to go higher than what we thought in December, but we're not doing it with a big jump, um, you know, with an increase of 0.5. That would be my guess in terms of how they reconcile the two views to make everybody happy. So that's I my see. guess. Well, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting because you've made some great calls, Jim. And we're at that point where it's like, do you, do you stand in the way? Do you, do you call a reversal here? Do you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's tricky, right? It's not easy. It's not always as easy as yep. it should be. Well, it is. I mean, that's just, the, you know what? The thing about trading is, is knowing when one has a high conviction in something and then also knowing where don't force it. Don't try to be a hero and make a call just to make a call. It, it's recognizing that markets are hard. I mean, it's, it is hard, you know? Um, and that's why I think it's important to kind of just, you know, hold your fire at times. And to me, we're at a point in time where, gee, uh, markets could have trend, you know, a rebound from the recent sell-off. Yep. Uh, the magnitude of that rebound can't be known. My overall view is like in terms of the S&P is, we're, okay, we're setting up for a bounce because I think the markets have swung too far in terms of, oh my God, what the Fed's going to do. And if I'm right about employment and the CPI and other data comes in a little softer for the month of February, that sets up, oh, they're only going to go 25, not 50. And you're going to get a reflex rebound in the markets that have reacted negatively to what's taken place in the last three, four weeks with the news and economic data. So um, again, I think the bigger trade is trying to find a short <laughs> in the S&P. And at some point in time, that probably will create to going long treasuries, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, we're, we're just not there yet. And, you know, right here is kind of a little tricky. All right. So. All right. Well, Jim, I, I appreciate you every week, you know, guiding us through the markets. I know many traders are watching this and they appreciate you too. So make sure you give Jim a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss these, these weekly videos with Jim. Um, what's the best way to follow you 
rather than just watching you every week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can actually get more information up to date. In other words, you would have gotten the, the special report on February 1st to buy the dollar today, sell the dollar. Macrotize.com or send me an email, Jim Welsh Macro, and I'm happy to send out a recent publication so you can get a direct idea of you know what I'm trying to do of combining fundamental analysis and technical analysis with a pretty good understanding of monetary policy tossed in. All right, Jim. Well, I want to thank you very much for for uh, being with us uh, today and and every single week. And um, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Blake. You too. Hey, traders. Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.